Hello, Ray Phoenix here. Welcome to Let's Play Spire of the Dragon, part 11. And we've cleared the- we've won over and completed one of the levels already in Beastmaker. So let's just say it's the first level of Beastmaker, so what is the first level? Because it's- because levels pretty much are non-linear in this game. You don't have to play the levels in a specific order. Pretty much play them in any order. And, and since there's no power-ups or any kind of weapons you get from collecting from beating one level first, it doesn't really matter then what order you play the levels in. You can even play the boss first. Heck, I bet you don't have to play any of these levels at all. I bet I, right now I have enough progress in the game I could just skip to the next world, the next home world of the game. Because I've been a, such a completionist, because this game doesn't expect you to be a 100% completionist, but I have been a 100% completionist up to this point, so I pretty much have enough enough, enough to skip the next world, maybe even, maybe even the world after that, too, and let's go right to the end of the game. What are the lowest possible percentages to 100% complete this game with is? I know, I bet someone could easily answer that question. I bet if I watched a speedrun, it would answer that question. I, did, I have considered doing speedruns of this game, or if you get far again in this game of getting the least amount of requirements possible. So there's yet, in this hidden, in this little, little, little hidden hole right here, there is yet another one of my favorite levels this world. The Wild Flight. Every world has at least one flight, and this one's going to be, as the title suggests, pretty wild. Things are going to get really wild in this world. We're going to be sent flying really fast and just attacking all of our usual targets. There's that Nork on the, on the, on the boat, the boat, the infant engine in it. And then there's these airplane flying Norks. There's this treasure chest. They look the same. They just look like they just took what they, what we had before and just rearranged them. And again, kind of all the flight levels in this game are kind of like that. They just take what we've already had from before and just, and just rearrange it so it makes a new world, a new level. This is by far the most challenging flight level in this game yet, I think. It's more challenging than the ones in the first few worlds, because it is, because this game definitely does have, you know, progressive difficulty. Each world does get more and more challenging as they progress. But then again, I think the last world of this game is not really one of the hardest worlds in this game. But then again, the last world of the game is actually one of the most straightforward worlds of this game. It's also one of the only worlds that I don't think has a flight level. I don't think there are any flight levels in the last world of this game, so that's actually, that actually makes it, it is a very short world as well, too. It's supposed to be challenging, where you get pussy for Ratchet and Clank style action, where there's like the enemies, like large enemies everywhere in the cons gunning you down, trying to gun down Spyro, and Spyro must run through them and kill them all so you can get all the gems off of them. We kind of are interested in getting gems from destroying everything in this game, because Spyro games pretty much aren't just Again, they're the precursor of Ratchet and Clank games. You just go and mindlessly destroy everything. And that's probably why these games are actually a lot easier than Crash Bandicoot games. Because Crash Bandicoot games, to get some of the gems in those games, you have to play through whole levels without breaking a single box in the game. You actually have to carefully plot your way through the levels and carefully know which direction to go so you don't accidentally break any boxes. Crash Bandicoot games involve a lot more careful plotting and careful, like, you know, trying to figure out how to get through levels. And Spyro has some of that, but not really as much. And that's the key reason why I liked Spyro a lot more as a kid. To this day, I still like Spyro a lot more. I like to think he was PlayStation's true mascot. He was a much better mascot than Crash Bandicoot. Spyro was better mascot material. A Bandicoot, I know, an obscure Australian marsupial, or a mythical creature, which is a dragon. They get dragged, not all dragons are you know, mythical. If there was such a thing as a Komodo dragon or some of those lizard things, they could have made him a lizard or something like that, but there aren't as a lizard that was out at the time. His name was Gax. He was in a few games that came out at the time. His first game, I think, was like a 2D platformer, then there was a 3D platformer one. There was one on the N64 that wasn't that good, and then there was one on the PS1 that was a lot better. It was a Gax game on the PS1. I never actually played any of those Gax games before, so actually, I'm kind of speaking of something I know absolutely nothing about. So, I don't know, I really don't know. Maybe I should get to those games. I know there's still a lot of games out there I've never, to this day, I've still never played. I still never played Glover on the N64, which I heard some people, so I actually think I did try playing that once in my Raspberry Pi, but, but I never really got far. Like, I only played for like 10 minutes and gave up. But again, the Raspberry Pi isn't very good at emulating N64. My A53 has never been able to successfully emulate N64 either. There's still a lot of other games I've never, never actually played for, sometimes because I never found them anywhere, or simply because I just never had the time and effort to play them. There's just way too many games that exist. Since I've you know, perfected emulators, or since emulators become perfected, it's really easy now to get any game you want to play at your fingertips. But even, but even then, there's still stuff that's gonna slip through the cracks. I just recently, a few months ago, played Motor Tune Grand Prix for the first time with some weird racing game on the PS1. It was supposedly one of the first games ever released on the PS1. It's very Roger Rabbit-esque. It's also it's like Who Framed Roger Rabbit, it's, but it's a racing game, kind of like a cartoony racing game kind of thing. So it, was, it was decent. I, actually, I should probably should play more before I make a bold claim about it. 
so far the only racing the only there are only like very early ps1 racing game i've played was the original ridge racer and then brought up another thing another early, somewhat early ps1 game which is rage racer rage racer is a third game in the ridge racer series it's also my least favorite ridge racer games so in the ridge racer series started to become more like world of warcraft you have to play for every level over and over again several times over and you earn credits and you can like buy new cars you have to play the game each level there aren't even that many levels of the game the original ridge racer had a lot more better replay value than rage racer <laughs> I haven't really played any of the Spyro games after Spyro 4, and I don't think I've played any of those at all actually after Spyro 4, so I don't really know much about modern Spyro that much. I've still never played, I'm trying to think, what else, whatever games have I never played? It's fine, now I'm talking about games I've never played, things I'll never say, things I'll never play, probably. Well, hmm. I'm trying to think, I never played that Obi-Wan Kenobi game on the original Xbox. Some people say it's really good, and some people say it sucks, but I wouldn't know because I never played it that much. I think I have seen that game in stores before, but... I didn't have an Xbox. It was until more recently that I had an Xbox. It was actually many years ago now, so it's not exactly recent, but I'm probably never getting another Xbox again. That's probably the same reason why I'll never play Star Wars Republic Commando. I never played the full game of Star Wars Republic Commando before. That's because it only came out on Xbox and PC. I'm not much of a PC gamer, so I'd probably play it on Xbox. My Xbox is pretty much dead now, and I don't plan on buying another Xbox again. But I see what the game looks like. It looks like a pretty good game. I never played, played any of the newer Battlefront games. I tried playing Star Wars Battlefront Elite Squadron once, but gave up on it. I might try playing that one again. I never played Wipeout HD Fury on the PS3, but I, know, I might play one. I don't really play a lot of PS3 games that much. I've had the Twisted Metal PS3 game from 2012 for years now, but I've still never played it, never once played it. Some people also have a lot of mixed opinions. Some people say it's like one of the greatest Twisted Metal games ever, and some say it's not that good. Or Fiendly said it came very close to being good. I never played Rayman Gold before, but I think that's probably because it's a PC game. I think it's just a PC remake of the original Rayman. It only works on PCs that have MS DOS on them, so like Windows 95, Windows 98, but it doesn't work on anything after Windows 98, so that's out of the question then. Sure, I think what else did I play? I have played, I, I tried playing the PC version of Star Wars uh, Dark Forces. I can't get past the second level though. I didn't get very, very far in that game. And I think that game's a little bit overrated sometimes. Then there's Dark Forces 2, which I've had a demo for that, but it didn't work very well. It only works on my Windows XP computer. It's the only machine I have that runs it. I never played the full game. I actually did see that game at a store once. At a, at a, I, think was, I think it was a discount store once, actually. I actually saw that game there for PC. But no, it was, it was a discount store. Sorry, it's a pawn shop. And I, want, I was a little bit tempted on buying it. My mom said, no, it's not going to work in any computer we have. So there's no point in buying it. I'm trying to think of what else that I've never played before. I don't know, there, there's probably more games now, like, considering how, how I don't really play rep modern games anymore, I'm just limited to only classic games, there's probably way more classic games that I have played than there are ones I have yet to play, because, you know, they're obviously they're not making any new classic games, otherwise it wouldn't be classic games then if they were still making them to this day, so pretty much oversaturated, that's probably the why I don't really buy very many new video games much anymore, because I've oversaturated the market pretty much, like, I've bought way too many games. There's some games that would like to own that I don't. Like, like there's a game on the Sega Genesis called Wrist Star. It's a, it's a game that, that came out in 1995, one of the later um, games in the Genesis. It was a pretty good game. I often regard it as being Sega's Kirby. I've never owned, have owned a physical cartridge that came before, and that's simple because I can't find one anywhere for an affordable price. But yeah, so that's one I would like to do. I mean, then again, it took me years to get a lot of other games. Like, it took me many years to get Rocket Knight Adventure on the Sega Genesis. I eventually did get it, but it was like so many years after I initially wanted the game. It took me like six, like six or seven years to find a, that game. But for the longest time, Ratchet Deadlocked was a mystery to me for the longest time. It's like it's Ratchet and Clank spin off in the PS2. I didn't know what it was for the longest time, but then eventually did bought by that game, and I haven't played that game in years, so that's a game I would like to revisit sometime soon, maybe, or maybe I probably will be revisiting that one soon. I haven't really played any of the Ratchet and Clank games after the PS2 era. The only the PS2 Ratchet and Clank games are the only real Ratchet and Clank games I've ever played. And then there's, um, well, I did play two of them on the PS3. I played the All for One, which is not really a traditional Ratchet and Clank game. It's more of a beat em up than anything else. And I also played two, um, Tools of Destruction, I think, on the PS3, but that was about it. I'm actually in the market of getting, uh, I actually haven't wanted to get rid of my PS3 for some time. I don't think it's justified for me to have one anymore because of how I barely use it, very seldom use the 
PS3. It was used for playing PS1 games that I didn't really have because it's the best way to play PS1 games and save data. And save data on your PS1, uh, and save data from PS1 games. But now I have emulators that do that a lot better, so, yeah. This level's actually, is also very similar to Ratchet and Clank, so I keep saying so many times over and over, so it's a lot like Ratchet and Clank. I also really like the music of this level. It sounds very, like, harsh kind of thing. I guess they kind of, they did a, I think Stuart Copen really did a good job of making the music fit the content of the level. Cause this level is, like, if you ever levels were smooth jazz, this would be rock and roll. This is a really harsh, rugged level, filled with so many enemies, and there's those weird frog things with the multicolored tongues. They only stuck those tongues into a rainbow slushy or something, or a rainbow milkshake or something like that and maybe it was warm which is why it burned into their tongue so i actually did have a warm milkshake once when i was in canberra last month i actually i was given a warm milkshake from a vendor then my mom warned me oh you have to be careful of warm milkshakes maybe they weren't stored properly you could uh, yeah i don't uh, nothing happened with that but still it's kind of an odd thing a warm milkshake something you would never expect how could such a thing exist like hot ice how does hot ice exist how does ice get hot and not melt I mean, it probably is possible to make ice not melt. I mean, I knew it's, I remember in Buffalo, New York, I think it was in Buffalo, New York, or Niagara Falls, New York, or somewhere like that. There's a skiing place there that's open 365 days a year, and it has snow that never melts, and it's like a huge mat of snow you go know, skiing there. It says that it's probably open 365 days a year, which would mean they're closed on February 29th, so they would have had a closure this year because this year is a leap year. So there was a February 29th this year, so they would have been closed on that day then. They're only open pre-65 days a year. <laughs> so, so yes, we have pretty much most of what there is to collect in this level. We have the whole game 64% complete now at this point. We have almost two thirds of this game completed already. Really plowing through this game. I know this game very well. I consider the beating this game be one of my greatest gaming achievements when I was younger. When I was younger, beating any game was considered a big achievement. But especially because this is something I considered to be impossible when I was a kid, and now I can do it now like it's nothing. I've done it a, a few times now. It's starting to like lose its merit, if that makes any sense, or lose its novelty, whatever you call it there, because I've done it so many times now. Just like the original Jumping Flasher, I'm still trying to solve the bizarre mystery of how do you unlock Hyper Mode in that game. I've tried playing that game several times. Sometimes I unlock Hyper Mode, sometimes I don't. Try looking up stuff in here, and the internet doesn't even know how to unlock Hyper Mode. Considering how well hidden it is in the game, some people don't even think this mode of gameplay exists. And it's supposedly absent from the European version of Jumping Flash as well, too, so it really is a mystery. I wonder if there's any like, hidden modes of gameplay in this, in this that I don't seem to know about. Maybe there is some hidden secret that's been hiding from me all these years, and I never would have known about it because you had to do something very specific in order to get it. I don't know if there's any hidden stuff like that. I doubt there is any hidden stuff like that in this game, but you never know. There could be. There could be all kinds of hidden Easter eggs or hidden goodies or stuff like that. Bad friends that you wouldn't know about if you never were never able to unlock them or something like that. I'm gonna collect the rescue guy Bubba. Yeah, rescue Bubba. What a generic name for a character in a game. Bubba also makes me think of Bob from or Bob and Bob from Bubble Bobble. Uh huh. And then there and they were also in those Bust a Move games. There were the two there were two of the characters in the original. Bust a move. I played the original Bust a Move quite a bit at arcades in in Australia. There's like that arcade they have in the Britain, the the largest retro arcade in the Southern Hemisphere, the One Up Arcade. They have they have the original uh, Bust a Move or Puzzle Bobble, as some people like to call it. There, it was it was a really, it's a really fun experience to play that on an actual arcade cab, and it's way better though, because that's something a lot of like, kids don't understand these days is that they're playing a game on an arcade is a magical experience. It's almost as magical as flying into space. Or, you know, like, or getting some very rare opportunity presented. And, because arcades are mostly a thing of the past, as I said in so many of my videos before. Then again, even console video games are starting to become a thing of the past, too. A lot of people don't buy console. I've heard console games are oversaturated now. People don't want them anymore. And then and handheld game systems are gone, too. Eventually, video game systems in general are going to be gone. Who's going to want to play video games on something that's only a video game system? And they can have it all in one convenient little location. It's kind of like the reason why phones are based to everything now. Everyone wants everything on their phone. They don't like having separate devices for things. And one of those days, that's going to come back to bite us all in the ass because eventually it's going to be... Because eventually it's going to be you have it all saved in one in one place, which is on your phone, and then and then someone's gonna, then your phone's gonna get stolen or broken or something. You're gonna get locked out because Google likes locking people out of their accounts a lot of the time, apparently, or something, or something like that. Because phones are run by very sus companies. 
So yeah, I'm pretty just gonna make it a big, it's gonna become like another Titanic situation where you put too much faith in technology and technology betrays us. Oh boy, I'm just waiting for that to happen. It's been the next few years, something like that's gonna happen and people are gonna start to listen to my videos. It's gonna be the one thing that'll make my, my career as a YouTuber, my YouTube career gets me called that actually makes it meaningful because people start listening to me but then when that happens people won't be going on youtube anymore so people won't be watching my videos then so then no one's actually gonna watch my videos then so that kind of makes it pointless then <laughs> so we got all 500 gems most levels in this game seem to have 500 gems now seems to be the more common average now this is ray phoenix signing out